Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen. This is going to be like a, a PowerPoint presentation. So you should be able to see our screen here pretty soon. Does that come through? Anybody want to nod your head? I can see you. Oh, you know what? If you pin yeah. his video, it's going to make him big and not his, not the sharing big. So you might want to unpin while he's sharing, if that makes sense. Yeah. How do I do that? Well, you don't have to do that. Just the. No, um, I want to do that. I want to. So I want to get rid of this, right? There we go. Okay, but it still isn't big. It's big for, for um, I see it big. Do you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then we'll get started. Actually, I'm going to do a little bit more introduction. Uh, Julie, we did a, about eight years of uh, a sailing circumnavigation. And when we got back, uh, after a little while, Julie decided to write a book about it. Uh, that book got bigger than we thought it would be. Uh, that was Escape from the Ordinary. And we ended up deciding to publish the books in two different books. So there's two books about the, the, the uh, circumnavigation. Uh, Julie was the author, for sure. Uh, she says I was the captain. Uh, that's probably right, because if you're at all familiar with on the Navy, the captain goes wherever the admiral tells him to do, and Julie was both the navigator and the admiral, so we kind of went where she said. Uh, the books themselves talk about a lot of the really on-sea and on-shore experiences we had. Uh, it's kind of uh, cherry-picking the very best parts of those, and the books are doing really, really well. Uh, they're both for over a year and a half now and Amazon number one bestsellers about well, it's seven categories and growing up to about 10 different categories. Uh, so we're really happy about that. But when we do talk to people or they find out that we sailed around the world, uh, they always have a set of questions that aren't really addressed and answered in the book. And those are the questions you see on your screen right now. And so when we put this talk together, we decided that we would try to answer the questions that we think most people are going to ask anyway. And that's pretty much the format of, of our talk today. And when, we, when I graduated from high school, I joined the Army as an E1 private. And they said the language school to learn Russian and eventually also to officer candidate school and I became an officer. And I was, a, I was a military intelligence officer for my entire career. I worked with the Russian language and my last assignment was working in Russia doing nuclear weapons inspections. And you can see that it was pretty cold there. And before that I also had one year separation deployment a lot of deployments away from Glenn, and we used to teach your eyes, kind of a carrot. At the end of the career, I'll be able to retire, and we can sail around the world, and uh, the military is a great career because even though it, it beats the heck out of you while you're in there, you get to retire after a little over 20 years, and half, you know, your pension is half of your pay, so it's and with medical benefits. So it seemed like the perfect thing. We wouldn't spend too much money living on a boat. And Glenn had, Glenn had also been in the military earlier and he re retired from the government. So with our pensions, we thought uh, this would be something great. We're both type A people. We won't uh, get bored. It'll be something different. We won't have to be separated, but we can do something adventurous. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. Okay, one of the even Glenn, you're breaking up a little. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, so they often ask, which way did you go? Meaning circumnavigation. 
And we find that kind of an interesting question because there's really only one good way to go around the world if you're going to be doing it on a sailboat and you're not racing or doing something very extreme. And that's from east to west. In our case, we, uh, we bought a boat in La Rochelle, France. And that's up in, let's see if I can make my pointer work here. Laser pointer. It may or may not work. It's a little bit slow probably, but La Rochelle, France is up in this area here. And actually we followed uh, the same route that Columbus did in 1492. And that is you, you just start going to the west and go down to uh, the Canary Islands, located uh, down off the tip of Africa, and then you just go west. Uh, and the, the places that we went and how, what time of the year and so forth to go, that's all been really well documented. And you can see that in the, in the three books that, that were kind of our Bible uh, to tell us when to go, what the weather's going to be, and what it's like checking into different kinds of ports and so forth. Those are the three books shown down at the bottom. Julie, we can't hear you now. I think you guys have to just be really close. Nope. I can't hear you. Get a little closer, I think. I can't, Julie, you're going in and out. All right, what about now? Is that better? Perfect, yep. Okay. So we spent four years in the Pacific Ocean, and you can see how we use New Zealand in our base. You can see down there where New Zealand is, how we went back and forth four times. We had to sit out the tropical cyclone season, and we used New Zealand as our base. We would say six months in New Zealand, then return to an island group like Tonga or Fiji or Vanuatu or New Caledonia for the other six months. Okay, so this is this is where I was a navigator, and this was my station here. Although we we basically lived full time on the boat, and it was also where I wrote my articles. And uh, but you can see that that's where this is the radar station, and that laptop there has a moving map display with CDs of all of the all of the harbors, the entire world on a map, on, on all the navigational charts are loaded on that computer and connected to the GPS. So you can be in the middle of the ocean and see on, on this navigational chart, you'll see an icon, like a monopoly token of your boat there sailing along. And that's how we navigate. But it's not foolproof because those charts are taken from the latest survey. And in some cases, that was Captain Cook in the 1700s. And if you look on this, this is a, a cutout of that navigation program. And the red line is a trace of, of where our boat went. And you can see that obviously we were not on land. So you would never want to move around at nighttime. Uh, that's the green is, is reef or land. And uh, so it, it got kind of tricky. It wasn't, I mean, in some ways we were had a great advantage with our GPS and our moving map. On the other hand, it's still a dangerous world out there. And you can see the radar uh, over, if you look at the nav station, you see the radar, uh, the, the single sideband radio, the ham radio. We used to send email over, Glenn's an engineer and he uh, had it hooked up where we could send very short email bursts over our single sideband radio, which had us very, very well connected. And this is the, uh, in, this is our boat. It's an Amel Super Maramu. And it, the cockpit in the bottom right, this is where we basically lived outdoors. Um, that was the help sea where whoever, when we were underway, we always had somebody on watch Glenn or, or myself, and uh, that's the, 
the top right photograph, we had a, uh, a canvas cover made for when we were at anchor or in a marina in really, really hot climates. There is some, you know, near the equator is a little steamy and there's no, if, if you're at anchor, usually you have a little bit of wind coming down, but uh, we lived outdoors basically for eight years. Now this is the inside of it. So the next time you're looking at your kitchen and thinking that you might want to remodel it, kind of like you to think about the galley. This was my kitchen for, um, for almost eight years. And uh, on the, le the bottom left, that, that stove is gimbaled. That means that no matter how much, how healing, how much you are healing, you might be healing as much as 12 degrees while you're sailing the stove stays level so that whatever you're cooking. But I never got too ambitious when we were in heavy weather or healing too much. Uh, always kept a can of peanut butter handy and uh, tried before long passages would make some, some entrees, pre-cook them so we wouldn't have to do anything, any heavy cooking out there. The, uh, the top right is, they call it a, a salon or saloon and a sailboat, but basically it was our living room. And that's where I did a lot of writing and uh, we mostly ate in the cockpit. Very rarely would we eat down below, except in malaria areas, we would put up screens on the hatches and the, and the portholes to, so we wouldn't get any mosquitoes in. But uh, usually we ate in the cockpit. And this is, this is the, what a, a stateroom looks like on the boat, that bottom right. If, if you were to come visit us, that's where you would have slept. And uh, we always had, we had our stateroom and then a guest stateroom. And we also had a, two heads, two, two toilets. And so if you would come visit us, you would have had your own head, which, which might seem like no big deal, but it's kind of a luxury on a sailboat. Okay. One of the other questions we have is, you know, did you, did you stop at night? Uh, no. <laughs> In fact, you, you really just can't do that. Once you take off sailing and you're crossing an ocean, it's, you're sailing 24 hours a day. Uh, and somebody always has to be awake and at the, at the helm watching for other traffic or taking care of uh, sail adjustments, that type of thing. So it's 24 hours a day uh, of sailing. Uh, our longest passages were the Atlantic Ocean crossing, the Pacific Ocean crossing, and uh, another long crossing that we had was from uh, Thailand to uh, the Gulf of Aden. And it was just interesting, All each of those long passages took 21 days. So here's, here's what our day looked like. Uh, typically we had uh, our, meal, our meals together uh, in the daytime. So typically we'd have breakfast around seven o'clock. That would leave both of us with free time to either nap, read a book uh, after that until noon meal, which we had together. And then we had another period of free time. And after that, uh, dinner at six, and then I would start my watch, and for most people, four-hour watches, we found that really hard to get up and down, up and down so much. And we broke our, our evening into uh, two, just two watches. I took the early one, and Julie came on around, around midnight, 1 o'clock, and took it until the early morning. Uh, one of the things that was really helpful when you're up alone at night uh, driving the boat essentially was to have audio books uh, to listen to that would keep you awake and interested and uh, our radar was set up that it would come on at night every every 20 minutes and it makes a, a big beeping noise so that always required you to look down at the radar and make sure there's no boats around you. So that happened every 20 minutes. And of course, uh, Julie really got it and she really liked early morning uh, watch because the stars are just so bright 
and when you're out in the middle of the ocean there is absolutely no other light around so uh, they're very very vivid uh, one of the questions we have is did you fish yeah we fished uh, actually i'd like to say we caught because i, I we did not use uh, a rod and a reel like uh, like you might do if you're normally fishing we drug uh what we call hand lines in the water behind us and i'll talk a little bit more about that and we would catch fish even in the middle of the ocean uh, fish that are called pelagic fish are are traveling fish and those are usually uh dorado what you probably familiar with is mahi mahi the the fish that is shown on the left of this screen uh tuna wow. And and the right hand side of the screen is a, is a fish that you find a lot more around islands and reefs, and that's a, a wahoo. Uh, the fish in the middle. Uh, sometimes when you catch a fish in the middle of the ocean, there's also shark or barracuda, and sometimes more than once we've had uh, cases where the that flopping fish that we're trying to bring in. Uh, from the back of the boat attracts uh, a shark or a barracuda and more than one fish that we brought in we didn't get the whole fish uh i'm gonna go through this pretty quickly unless there's any real fishermen here who want to know more but uh, this is kind of the setup that we had on the left hand side of the screen we tied that a uh, real heavy line it's a it's a monofilament line uh, to the boat. We used a bungee cord to take the shock out of the, the uh, line when a fish got it. And over on the right hand side, Julie was really uh, liked a lot, a lot. The, the pink squid is a, is a lure. Uh, so that was our setup. Uh, of course, then uh, there's a, you needed to have a clothespin. Well, you use a clothespin to tie the line to the boat to, and when a fish hits the line it snaps the line out of that clothespin and it makes quite a racket and it gets your attention. You need gloves in order to uh, bring the line in. We bring that line in hand over hand uh, trying to keep the fish up out of the water. Uh, if we were to bring in those kind of fish that you saw in the previous picture uh, on a rod and reel, it'd probably take 20, 30 minutes to bring one of those in, uh, bringing them in with a hand line. That's why I call it catching. You've got that fish on board within four or five minutes. Uh, you probably wonder what the, the rum is for, uh, and it's not to celebrate, but it is to, uh, when, you, when, you, when we first started fishing, we bring these large fish on board, and they're flopping all over the place, uh, makes a mess, and it's really quite dangerous. And the, the standard way to kill a fish would be to beat it over the head with what people carry on as a billy club. But what we found is that if you just take a little bit of alcohol, cheap alcohol of any kind, and pour it down the gills, uh, they will be dead in, in just a, a maybe 30, 40 seconds and no mess, no fuss. Uh, I'm not sure what that tells you about drinking alcohol, but it certainly worked well with the fish. And then that's a beer. Uh, so the beer isn't for celebrating either. Sometimes when the fish tear up the, the pink squid and we didn't have any more lures on board, we could take the beer can and cut it with scissors and tie it to a hook and drag that behind the boat and it would catch fish almost as good as, as a pink squid. So that's what we did when we're offshore. When we're near islands, uh, I like to, although both Julie and I are scuba divers, we find that it's really an awful lot of work to scuba dive from a boat, and particularly when you're living on a boat and you don't have access to, uh, uh, air resupplies and that kind of thing. So I started doing free diving. That's that's a kind of diving where you just you kind of pump up your lungs a little bit and then you jump overboard and uh, hold your breath and go down and 
and swim that way. Uh, I got to where I could I could hold my breath underwater for about two minutes, and then you could spearfish. And so that was the second way we uh, we did fishing. And people ask, you know, what did you do all day long? And everything that if something takes an hour on land to do, it's going to take at least two hours on a boat. And of course, then there's always washing your clothes in a bucket. That that's very time consuming. And uh, then at nighttime, anytime you are at anchor on an island with other sailboats, even if this was the first time you ever saw that sailboat, somebody would dinghy over and say, we'll meet you for sundowners on the beach at 4.30 and then you would be friends from then on. And then you never know, you would, you would run into people, other people sailing around the world all, all over the place. You never knew when you would, you would connect with somebody that you met uh, the week before or two years or previously. And also we felt like exploring was our job. We felt like to be in these remote, off the beaten path places, it was our duty to go out and, and experience things. And, and our books are full of good stories of con mostly about our encounters with other people in faraway places of uh, Sudan on the left and uh, New Zealand on the right. Lots of stories about, uh, about the Pacific Islands, New Zealand, Australia, and, uh, and on through the Indian Ocean, Bali, Borneo, Indonesia. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a wonderful life. It's, we we're so lucky to be able to do it. Um, one one time we got off our boat and got onto another boat that little boat you see on the left we we called it the african queen we were up in the island of borneo and we we wanted to go up to an orangutan preserve and uh that was one of one of the more exciting adventures because we had to to anchor our boat in the middle of a very small river and get on this boat and we were in these gigantic barges were tooling by creating we were we were a little nervous about leaving our boat since it was really the only possession we had and our floating home but we were we were gone for three days and uh it was fantastic and there's some good stories about the orangutans in the book too and then of course here you know provisioning was my i loved that's what we used to call shop grocery shopping is called provisioning when you're on a boat and it was a chance to get out and meet people and buy buy food that that uh, you might not be accustomed to, you might not even eventually like, but you wanted to try. And and everyone the world over was just so friendly. We we people loved Americans, even if politically they didn't like America, they really liked Americans. <laughs> and uh, this was in Sudan. And uh, it was it was wonderful. The the places that we were most afraid to go were turned out to be the best. Interestingly enough, and also uh, on some islands it was a little more difficult. You know, some islands the people are just super friendly, like in Fiji. In other islands, a little more standoffish. And what we found was that if we would go to the marketplace on a Saturday, we would usually get invited to church on Sunday. And so we would do that. And then we would be invited to their home. So we would bring some food from our boat. And it was a great way to meet people. We had, there's lots of good stories about uh, our encounters. Okay. And one of the other questions that always comes up is, is what about storms? Uh, yeah, they're out of eight years of living on a boat and sailing around the world, we definitely had storms. Uh, because just like living anywhere, you, you have thunderstorms, you have uh, gales coming through, that type of thing. We had two uh, pretty uh, extreme experiences that are written in the boat out of eight years. Uh, so I would say, yeah, there, there were storms, but there were a lot more beautiful sunsets. And it's kind of interesting to us that nobody says, well, how many beautiful sunsets did you experience? 
So now we're going to talk about some of our some of the stories and some of our favorite places. That's always a, a everybody asks, what's your favorite island? That type of thing. We'll talk about some of those stories. The probably our favorite islands were the Fijian Islands. And when people say, Oh, you went to Fiji, most people think they're talking you're talking about an island. In Fiji, Fiji, there's actually about 330 islands. About one third of those are populated, uh, so they have people living on those islands. We spent uh, six months in Fiji, uh, three months traveling up on the east side of the island that you see, it's called Suva there. Uh, the east side of those islands are hardly ever visited. Uh, there's probably 10, 10 sailboats that will go through there in a year. And we spent about three months over on that side. Really a wonderful, wonderful experience. The Fiji that everybody knows and loves is on, on the west side of those two big islands. Uh, and that's where you find the sandy beaches and the palm trees and, and most of the resorts. And in two totally different environments, and we spent three months in both sides. Uh, really a wonderful, wonderful place, probably the most friendly, friendly people in the world. Uh, an example is the word for hello in, in the Fijian language is bula, but you would never hear anybody say bula. You would always hear, as you're walking down the street, people would see you and they'd say bula bula you know, meaning hello, hello. It's just, you know, this the excitement of, of uh, talking to you from these friendly, friendly folks, incredible. The other thing that makes Fiji and very accessible is a, a ceremony they have that makes you part of the village when you arrive. You present the chief with a, a a root a, it's it's a, an herbal root called kava kava and it's very relaxing in the extreme i mean it's 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 sort of like the, their equivalent of happy hour and uh so you there's a official ceremony where you present this kava you sit everybody sits cross-legged and present the kava to the chief and and he blesses you and your home country and your boat and assigns a person to be your guide, your, like your mentor for the village. And you can come and go as you please. They'll invite Glenn to go spear fishing on the reef or take me uh, hiking or walking or, or cooking. It, it's a great way to become part of the village. And there was never another country that we found quite like it. And there's, Glenn's wearing a, a Sulu. Many of the men wear skirts on, in Fijian islands. The, the ceremony, uh, you perform that ceremony because you're going to be anchoring at, at, at an island. And it's a kind of a different situation. The, the, the people on the island also own the water in front of the island. So it's, if you didn't ask permission, it's kind of like somebody coming up and parking their RV in your backyard without asking permission first. So the whole thing is uh, going in and meeting the chief, saying, hey, we'd like to anchor out here and visit your island. And, uh, and then you go through this ceremony. And it's not a ceremony for tourists. It's a, if if a, uh, a native uh, inhabitant from another island is visiting that island, he also goes and sees the chief and, uh, and performs a, a Sabu Sabu ceremony. This is one of our favorite islands, and here's a photograph of a kava bowl. So, so this man's, this Fijian man's name was Wanga, and he was the caretaker for this uh, Makanai Island, and it's a former, uh, it was a place where they kept all the lepers, and you can see those, those cottages that they had around the islands are abandoned, but they, all the doorknobs are down low because the first things to go on when someone has leprosy is are their appendages. 
and they would be crawling around and, and the whole island had, uh, everything was geared toward people who had lost their feet or their, or their hands. And uh, it was kind of an eerie place because the, I, the, the cottages had not been abandoned that long. And uh, those were some other sailors that were at anchor in the island. And we all got together for, for, for kava happy hour. And that's Wonga making the, the kava there. It tasted like dirty dishwater, but uh, but it was it would numb. It was very powerful. It would numb your lips and your tongue. Uh, I couldn't take it. I would just have to kind of pretend I was drinking it because it was way too powerful. But they they drink it for hours at a time. I think they I think you get a kind of a resistance to it. And here's an example of of anchoring out. You can see the depth of the water by the color of the ocean and behind there is the reef behind the behind our sailboats are, is a, a reef so you wouldn't want to drag anchor and anytime there was a high winds you would want to keep anchor watch at night on the gps to make sure you weren't dragging and uh then we would take our dinghies and to shore and we would if there was a school on the island we would visit the school we usually carried pencils and pens and notebooks to give out. And it was a great time. We would sing a song from America, something something just fun, like You Are My Sunshine. And they would sing us songs and it was great. We loved it. This is Vanuatu. This was, a, this was not, this is next to Fiji, it's west of Fiji, but it's, it has a totally different culture very very primitive more like uh papua new guinea than than the rest of the pacific islands and we arrived there from new zealand for a, a six-month tour of the islands and when we arrived the customs officer said are you here for the land diving and that's just we were the coincidence of that was astounding because years before when we were stationed in washington dc We'd been at a, a film festival from the Smithsonian, and there they had a, a vintage film of land diving from the 1930s. And this is this story is detailed extensively in my book, uh, one of my books. But it's it was pretty incredible coincidence because we we landed on one day and the ceremony was the next. So we had to sail overnight. We landed in Port Vila, the capital, and we had to sail up to Pentecost Island there just north of Port Vila. And it was pretty incredible experience. And uh, we have a film here. I hope that it will play on the Zoom. So the land diving, uh, what happens is that uh, at this particular time of the year, or this one island, the only place that ever does it, uh, creates a tower out of bamboo. The, this picture shows the tower that, uh, that we saw the land diving from. That tower is 105 feet tall, made out of vines and, and bamboo. And the, <clears throat> The participants stand on those platforms. You can see where the man is jumping off of a platform there. He, the, the night before, he goes and he cuts his own vines and ties them to the edge of that platform. And then after building up his nerve for, for some time and, and dancing, and there's a lot of singing and going on down below to encourage him, he ties those vines around his ankles, and he jumps off the platform head first. And the goal is to just touch his head to the ground without hurting himself. Uh, there were probably, probably 25 or 30 different jumpers on this. The, the last one jumped from the, the top. I've got a video in the next uh, scene these videos, we tried these out earlier and I just don't have enough bandwidth to have the video play very well. But this is, I'm gonna play it anyway because it, although it's jumpy, uh, it, uh, it will, let's see, I gotta do something here. Oh, I, I gotta make the uh, video setting.
Yeah, well, I don't it's not gonna anything here. Hang on for a minute. Share. Okay, I gotta share the sound. Here we go. Okay, we're gonna try it. Okay, so did uh, did that come through pretty well? Anybody see it at all, or is it just terrible? No, it looked good. It was a little choppy, but it looked you could tell it looks amazing. Okay, well, good. Then we're, we're gonna we got two more short videos, and we'll just keep giving it a try. Uh, did the audio come through? No, there was no audio. At least I didn't hear any audio. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, so another island that we went to in Vanuatu, uh, that island was trying to bring back a lot of the traditional customs of the uh, of the island. Uh, when the when the missionaries arrived at the islands, the the culture got lost, and some of the islands, just like the one that we just looked at, they are spending a lot of time trying to recreate their culture. Uh, this particular island uh, was had spent a lot of time trying to to recreate some of the original dancing that went on. They called it Kassam dancing, uh, that spelled correctly. Uh, and when we arrived there, uh, they were willing to do a demonstration for us. We thought it was just, we knew it was just going to be us and one other couple. And we thought it would be a, a maybe a 15 minute demonstration of their dancing. But as it turned out, it was a half a day event with a, a meal at the end. And so this is some of the custom dancing.
Um, there was a, just you in Phoenix, you can go see this. We had something, we were in Vanuatu on our way to New Caledonia, and we had dropped off some clothes whenever we would leave New Zealand or Australia for the islands. We would, we would bring, go to a thrift store and, and a lot of clothes to islanders. And we had distributed clothes at this one island earlier, and we were just there spend the night so that we could get a we didn't feel like leaving in the at night for a passage so we we thought we would just anchor out and they came out in their little dugout canoes and invited us to shore they said the women had a surprise for us and we said well we we already have our dinghy and our outboard put up so we can't get to shore and so they said no you know we'll come get you so they that the next morning they came and got us and gave us a uh, a a surprise of a water is something that they call water music and you're not going to be able to hear it because this is not working with uh, the video isn't working with zoom but when you go to the the museum of musical instruments in phoenix look up water music in vanuatu so that you can really appreciate what happened but but here's a picture of them coming to get us in the canoe so we have to get to shore. This is taken from our boat at an anchorage. And you know, over in the left-hand side of that video, you can see some people standing there and they're waiting for us to come to shore. So we need to get to shore. I'll start the video. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that video uh, now uh, because I'm I'm sure that you can't hear it. it. If we do this in person sometime, it, it's pretty incredible video. So what what was going on is that the the women on the, this particular island uh, would wash their clothes in a, in a stream, and then when they're through washing the clothes, they would put their clothes out on rocks to to dry the clothes and they'd have to stand around and wait for the the uh, clothes to dry and what they did to amuse themselves is they started they learned how to create different kinds of sound uh, by splashing in the water and it's a really incredible experience they have these big roop, roop kind of sounds and different rhythms and uh, this is another case of this is the only island where uh, they have water music. When we did go to the uh, the music museum, the musical instrument museum in Phoenix, uh, I, as we're going through the format there is that they have music from different places in the world. And I said, I'll bet they'll never have uh, the water music from Vanuatu. In fact, I don't, I'll bet they don't even have anything from Vanuatu. And as we're going through, all of a sudden we came upon a play from Vanuatu. And I said, well, they didn't have, I'm sure they're not going to have water music. And I was thinking of donating some of our film to, to them. But as it turned out, they had, I, they had a National Geographic uh, rendition of the water music there. So if you ever go to the Musical Instrument Museum, you can, you can see this. You can also see this online. If you just go to, uh, let's see, under Crossing Pirate Waters book on Amazon, I put the the video on on the down at the bottom of the book page where you can buy the book. There's a, a, a copy of this video. You can see it there. So this is pretty much says it for itself. It's not really uh, uh, where you're going, but the journey. And for us, it was a wonderful uh, eight years. 
uh, when we got back to the United States, uh, we decided that uh, we needed to do some kind of a, of a payback. We've had a really fortunate life. We're able to retire early and and uh, do the sale around the world. So uh, both Julie and I now do volunteer work, faster volunteer work with Red Cross, mostly in the international arena. Uh, we deploy to to different disasters. Uh, the, the picture on the left-hand side is uh, us in the Himalayas uh, in Nepal, uh, pre preparing for the earthquake. Uh, and then when the earthquake actually happened in Nepal, we were on the very first airplane into that. The picture down in the bottom right is uh, Julie and I setting up uh, communications. Uh, that's what we do for disasters. We set up disaster. Uh, and that's in Puerto Rico. So that's that's what we do spending our spare time now that we live in the mountains, uh, White Mountains, right there in Arizona. Uh, and uh, mountain bike and uh, pretty much uh, enjoy our, our retired life. The only boat we have now is a kayak. Anybody have any questions? Glenn, Glenn, you might want to unshare. Up oh, there, you go. Perfect. That's what I was going to say. Doing it. Oh, oh. Uh, where did you learn to sail? Well, it was a very long process. <laughs> um, Glenn was a much more experienced sailor than I was. He, uh, why don't you answer that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you my experience is that I, I've always been into water sports. Uh, I used to water ski and do that kind of thing when I was younger. And I just always knew that I was going to sometime change the sailboat. I don't, I don't know why I had never been on a sailboat, uh, but after actually in Arizona, I, I ended up buying a, a, a sailboat in California, went out and bought a sailboat, took it down to Mexico and taught myself to sail. Uh, so mm -hmm. mine was a lot of book learning and then uh, it was, Actually, it was over two years that I was sailing in in uh, Mexico uh, before I ever had anybody on board that had ever sailed before. So that was, yeah. that was kind of the interesting thing, and that's when uh, both Julie and I went back to to Washington area. Uh, I we sailed on the Chesapeake Bay and had a boat there. So. And, and how how big is your boat, or how big was the boat sailboat? It's uh, fifty two feet long. It's a it's a French built boat called a Amel Super Maramu. It's very seaworthy. That, that's why we went to we got one in France because uh, at the time they didn't build very many. They call them blue water boats. Most of the boats built in the United States are coastal cruisers. I, I'm sorry, you cut out. How long was the boat? 52 feet. Oh, that's big. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've been on a, a cat that was about that big, but that's big. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's big, but that was our home. That's the only thing we own. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. Lived, we lived on it for eight years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and did you see a lot of um, whales or sharks or anything like that? Yeah, you you would see a lot of and. We would do a lot, both Julie and I do a lot of snorkeling and free diving and, and, and we learn to just, the sharks are always there and we yeah. learn which ones are the good sharks and there's no good shark, but <laughs> the, which ones are the dangerous sharks and which ones are, are less dangerous. And if you got out of the water every time that you saw a shark, you wouldn't spend very much time in the water. So yeah, we saw a lot of sharks. And we had wonderful experiences with whales. Uh, we've had, in, you know, you can read that in, in uh, what, the first book, first Nui. Book. Uh, that we had experiences in, in Nui where we were anchoring there and every morning and every evening of whales, two mother whales and their, their offsprings would come and, and cavort around our boat. And, and we actually were able to get in the water with them. It was pretty interesting. It was so incredible. Um, first of all, 
can't even imagine we're all making it a few weeks, you know, being trapped together, but eight <laughs> years in a very confined space. So my, congratulations to you for that. Um, how did you learn the customs of these different countries or places where you were stopping, like to know to have the, the root ceremony and like, is that just Googling before you get someplace or how'd you, how'd you know all that? So, there were a lot of people doing this, a lot more people sailing around the world than you would imagine. And when we would meet somebody uh, like in New Zealand for the six months we were there, somebody who had already been to an island group, they would tell us everything they knew or we would, uh, or we would read a book that somebody had written about, about what we were doing. And, um, and then we would, like for example, we got to Fiji, we knew that we needed to go buy some kava in the, in the market in order to, to have some clumps of every island we went to, we had to have a, um, and they, they sell it in, in, in the capital in Suva to, because everyone's required to do this ceremony, even the Fijians themselves, not just foreigners. Another source of information was that they would have radio notes uh, with other sailors and we would be able to communicate with them by radio and typically those are either every morning or every evening and you could join the net and you could talk to someone maybe two or four hundred miles ahead of you that has just gone through the same set of islands you're going to be going through and they would give you uh, you know a lot of valuable information so that was another way in crossing pirate waters there's an example how we were entering the Red Sea and we, we wanted to go to Eritrea, but we learned on the radio net that there was some kind of really bad uh, bacterial infection going through that uh, wasn't responding to antibiotics, that all these, everyone who had been there had this terrible disease that they caught. So we, we were able to learn a lot by tuning into this radio net. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. What made you decide to leave everything behind and go on this grand adventure? What was your thinking behind all this? Well, we're, we're both very, very type A people. And we love to sail. And we had, been, we had been separated a lot in our marriage through the military and Glenn's work. He traveled a lot. And we felt like this was something that would, we could really get to know each other, living on a boat together. <laughs> and uh, we, we trusted each other, but we didn't really realize uh, how much we would grow, grow together and respect each other. You know, the amount of respect you have for someone when you live so close and you rely on each other for literally your lives on a daily basis is extremely bonding. And I know that it's, this COVID has been really hard on a lot of people who, who've had to be in close quarters for a long time together. But for us, it was like a long ocean passage. <laughs> you know? It was pretty wonderful, really. I think that uh, a lot of it we just, Making the decision just kind of grew on us. We actually got together uh, in the very first part of our marriage, sailing, and and that grew. And pretty soon we were uh, sailing in Mexico, and we had a boat in Mexico. Later, when we worked in Washington D.C., we had a boat in the Chesapeake Bay. So uh, we were sailing, and the the idea just kind of grew from let's do some serious maybe four or five months at a time sailing along the coast to all of a sudden we said well if we're going to do that wonder if we could if we could uh, sail the, to the Pacific and that grew into well if we're going to do that why don't we sail around the world and 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 it didn't happen overnight it happened over probably a period of four years or so where we thought we started planning on doing something like that and then spending most of the next period till our retirement getting prepared to do that. You know, also, I kind of feel like we, since we've been in the military, I don't think we really 
felt we just didn't realize how you know we all in the military you always have a lot of support you know you have a lot of a lot of support basically both physical and and teamwork i don't think we realized how vulnerable we would be out there and in the second book crossing pirate waters did have a, a pirate encounter that uh, we were pretty humbled by some of the, the things that are out there in the world. You mentioned um, washing your clothes in a bucket. Is that how you had to do it for the entire eight years? Well, every time you make landfall, the, one of the first things that you want to know is, is there a place that I can get okay. wash my laundry? But, you know, if you're out in a, an, an island group like Vanuatu, you don't have any laundromat. So you're basically washing your, your clothes in a bucket. Uh, and of course, you know, we have, we, you would wear clothes more than one day at a time. I mean, I know it, it's not something that you really want to think about doing in land now, but that was pretty difficult to wear one outfit for three or four days. Yeah. And just wash your underclothes in the bucket and uh, you would have your your clean pile, you would have your in you know, like this is just day two of this outfit, and then you would have your your dirty clothes that you would you just couldn't when you live in a small space, fifty two yeah, feet yeah. boat sounds big, but if something doesn't smell good or oh, if there's so dirt, <laughs> it's going to be right there in your face. So you just handle everything right when it happens. You know? And of course, when you're 21 uh, days off, landings, when you're 21 days in a passage, no island, not stopping, you're going to have to do laundry then too. Yeah, so especially your seeds. You know? I mean, you can do it in the sink. Yeah, you can yeah. do it in a bucket or sink and then just, just it fly out on the boom. Sure. You no, know, I mean it dries pretty fast. <laughs> and we had a water maker. We had a reverse osmosis water maker. We would we would uh, we would basically desalinate water at sea. And so we never had any shortage with our water. Although we did have one, two kind of emergency situations where 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 we if you read one of them was an escape from the ordinary. The other is in crossing pirate waters where we had some. Some bad things happen with our water maker and then we didn't know about it and we we, we were kind of nervous but somehow it all worked out well th thank you so much i mean that was fascinating i mean your pictures and your stories and i'm sure your books have even more stories like you said but truly thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today and um i found i went on while you were talking i found the water music clip that you were talking about so i'll send that out to everybody because i know i wanted to hear it so <laughs> i'll send okay, that out yeah. to everybody because it sounds really cool um but truly thank you so much i really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today well, you're welcome